If you want to get ahead a little bit, you can open to 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17 is what we'll look at today. Uh, Thinking about God meeting our needs, how God meets our needs. Often he does that surprisingly, unexpectedly, and we'll see how he does that in Elijah's life. Uh, but, but first, I want to share a story. So I was in middle school. It was my seventh grade year. And speaking of mission trips, I was on a mission trip with Valley View Chapel to uh, Sacandaga Bible Camp in like central New York, uh, north of here. We were doing like some cleanup and renovation and as much as middle schoolers are capable of. You know, a lot of painting, did a lot of painting and breaking and stuff like that. And one of the afternoons, we had a block of time off. So we all went down to the waterfront on the lake, Lake Sacandaga, and uh, my friends Jeremy and I got in a canoe and paddled out. And I was a very experienced canoeist or canoeer, you know, at seventh grade. I'd spend lots of time in, in a canoe. So I was like, you know, proud and arrogant and confident. I knew what I was doing in a canoe. So I was encouraging my friend Jeremy and I to like rock the boat and just to like play around. And then we rocked it and rocked it and then rocked it a little too much and it capsized. But again, I'm an experienced canoeer, and I thought, oh, this is fun. Jeremy, I know what to do here. Here's what you do. You want to roll the boat, and, and uh, we just kept rolling it. The, the idea was to roll it and like, get it to sit on top of the water, but it wouldn't do it. It just wasn't obeying. It just kept rolling and rolling basically underwater. Now, a canoe will never sink, but it might not float. So it was wholly submerged underwater. So Jeremy and I are sitting in the canoe underwater, in the middle of the lake. Like, we weren't near the shore. We weren't near the diving dock or swimming area. We were out there. You know, those motorboats are, like, going by. I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> I was too, and he was too proud to, um, like, wave frantically for help because we weren't drowning. The boat wasn't sinking, but it wasn't going to be going anywhere, and neither were we. So eventually, in God's mercy, um, one of the lifeguards saw us, sent a powerboat out there, And they got us in, and they they got the boat back to shore. And both Jeremy and I were so humiliated, especially me, because I was like, man, I was such a good canoeer. Well, again, I have to say, we weren't going to drown. We weren't going to drown. The boat wasn't sinking. But I and my friend had exhausted all of our know-how, all of our strength. Have you ever—has anyone been in a canoe that's been capsized? They're really heavy. Water weighs a whole lot, and when you're in water, yeah, it's hopeless. I mean, we were sunk out there, literally. Have you been in a place like that? Have you been in a place where you have exhausted all you got, everything you know, everything you can do, and you just got nothing left? You're sunk. Those are these beautiful times when God comes through and he meets needs. He meets them in ways that we never saw coming. He meets them often in ways that we wouldn't think to ask. So often, he might meet our need, but he meets the need beyond the need that we feel. He meets the need that's underneath the need that we feel. We're going to see all that in in this time in Elijah's life. But I need a little help. So, I need four volunteers. I'm not going to make you do anything. You're not going to have to capsize a canoe or walk on water. That would be pretty cool, though. Um, I need four unique people. First of all, I need someone who's been involved in government in some way, any kind of government. Maybe you work at a federal or state-funded job. I need someone. If this doesn't happen, I'm sunk. So who's, who's been in some kind of government capacity, your paycheck? All right, Laura, come on up. Laura. Um, Laura, you are going to represent the king. Okay, just kind of put this right on, right on there. All right. Uh, somebody who is a pastor, where's the pastor or someone who has worked in a church ministry or, you know, some kind of spiritual ministry. Looking at my good friend and mentor. Yes, Pastor John. All right. Great. Pastor John, you're going to represent our priest, so just put that on. Um, Who is a farmer? Now, you don't have to make your living, but who's worked with the land, grown some stuff? Who has grown stuff from the earth? Come on. Yes. Yeah, Dale. All right. 
Dale's a legitimate farmer. Okay. Stone Eel had the best fall experience I've ever been to in the area. So, all right. And last of all, I need someone who is um, someone who's a banker or made investments. Works with money. You you make a living by working with money. Someone who's a banker, made investments. Someone's out there. Someone's out there. All right, great, great. All right, again, just put that on there. Okay, at this time, in, in 1 Kings 17, at this time in Israel's history, <laughs> they had, Israel had depended, they had depended on many different things to meet their needs. First of all, they had depended on the king. The king was supposed to organize Israel's uh, economy and take the surplus goods that people grew, that the farmers grew, and then redistribute them uh, to all the people in the land who needed them. However, that wasn't happening. Instead, what the king was doing was taking all the resources, the taxes, basically making all the, the common people, the peasants, indentured servants, slaves, to provide for his royal family, for the capital city, for the people that were the elites. And so at this time in Israel's history, there's a great chasm in classes. There's the upper class, 5 10% of the people, and then the lower class. There's no such thing as middle class at this time in Israel. 90% of the people were impoverished, were barely making enough to live on. In fact, the king was making them grow crops that were good for trade and export, but were not good for living off of. So you had a lot of wine presses, uh, olive groves and stuff. Well, you can only drink wine and drink olive oil so much. It won't keep you alive. The king wasn't having them grow grains that would let them survive. Instead, he was growing um, cash goods. The king had not been meeting their needs. The priest was supposed to represent God to the people, was supposed to keep them faithful to God. However, the priests had kind of gotten paired and pulled into the, the royal family the Palatine economy. And so instead of representing God to the priests and making a way for all to have access to God, the priests were basically the king's own personal religious entourage. They were not meeting Israel's needs. Jump over here to the land. Israel was living in the promised land. Okay, maybe you know some of your Bible story, Bible history. Israel had come into this promised land that God said to their forefathers, I'm going to give you this land. It's going to be abundant. It's going to provide for you. Uh, it's going to be overflowing with milk and honey, all these wonderful things. Well, it wasn't doing that these days by 1 Kings 17. We'll read there's a famine in the land. There's a drought. God stops the rain. So the land was no longer producing the food that the people needed, even if it were the king wasn't redistributing it as necessary, all right? Again, the land wasn't meeting the people's needs. So what did they do? What did the king do? They turned to Baal, Baal. These were the gods of fertility and agriculture. You know, back then, we, we're not so this, much this way, but back then, there was no separation between spiritual and physical. It was all one world, one universe. The gods were, were involved. And so people thought, okay, if the land's not producing, the king's not producing, let's call on Baal, the gods of our, of our surrounding nations, and ask these gods to provide for us. So they would worship uh, basically the gods of commerce. But the gods, Baals, weren't providing because there's a drought in the land. Everything Israel had depended on, either appropriately or inappropriately, was not meeting their needs. Thanks, guys. You can have a seat. So what do they do? What does God do? God provides a prophet. A prophet who, unlike the priest, would actually speak for God, would reflect God to the people, would mediate God's work to the people. And so in walks this man, Elijah, a prophet. Let's check out 1 Kings 17. Now, Elijah, his name, anyone know what his name means? The Lord is my God. There's there's intent, there's purpose in that name. Elijah. No one else 
had shown God. Elijah steps in. His name means the Lord is my God. The author of Kings wants us to catch something. Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe, you know what that means? <laughs> Tishbe means uh, settled, of the settled. So Elijah is a, just a common settler, a common person who is a man from and for and of God. Whoa, right from verse 1, the author is saying things are going to get different now. There's a common person, but who's got a relationship with an uncommon God. Elijah. Elijah the Tishbite, the prophet. Uh, he's kind of like the Robin Hood, you know, the common person who stands for and advocates and rescues those in need. He's the, the Spartacus or the Peter Parker, right? Normal guy with an uncommon mission to bring salvation. That's Elijah. Elijah the Tishbite. Um, in Gilead, said to Ahab, the king, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. I want to notice something first, right away. God will meet your needs. God will meet your needs. Right now, there's judgment in the land because they hadn't been turning to God. But God makes a move, and he's going to start to meet Israel's needs. Now, we won't get to the end of the story. That's some chapters later. But the point is for now, God will meet your needs. That's what God is going to show. Now, let's pick it up again. Verse, uh, where did I leave off? Verse 2. Lord, Lord, came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. Leave here. God says to Elijah, get away from this the horrible influence from the neighboring nations who don't worship God and your own countrymen who are supposed to worship God but don't anymore. Get away from all that. Get away from the king's reach. Get away from the promised land and meet with me. I've got an appointment with you. You're going to learn some things that you couldn't, wouldn't learn right here. God likes putting us in places where he alone must come through, where nothing that we've relied on so far is going to work anymore. He loves to put us in those uncomfortable spots where we have real need that we can't meet, that nothing can meet that used to be meeting it before. He loves to do that. The trouble is you and I are need averse, right? I don't like having needs. You don't like having needs. It doesn't feel good. It's not comfortable. It makes us feel weak and uh, incapable. Nobody likes having needs, yet that's the very thing God loves us to be aware of and to have so that we run to him and he can become the kind of God that we need him to be, that he is in his own. We're need averse, but God loves us to have need. Recipe for a real fun time, right? We resist the very thing God wants to use, and that's what he does for Elijah. There's a story um, you've probably heard, but in the early days of Dallas Theological Seminary, Dallas, Texas, um, it was founded in 1924, and shortly after that, they ran into real financial need. No more money to pay the bills. Basically, they were bankrupt, and uh, the creditors were, were calling, wanted their money. So the board of directors calls the board together, and they're praying. One of the men, as they're praying, says, God, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Meet our need now. Well, as they're praying, a man came to the door of the office and, and knocked on the door, and this is what transpired. A Texan, clad with boots and a cowboy hat, strolled into the business office and greeted the secretary with a howdy. What he said next would interrupt the prayer meeting. He said, I just sold two carloads of cattle in Fort Worth, and I've been trying to make a business deal go through, but it just isn't working. I feel God wants me to give this money to the seminary instead. I don't know if you need it right now, but here's a check. And of course, the check is for the amount that needed them to stay afloat. So the secretary knocks on the door of the prayer meeting, opens it up, and hands uh, Lewis Berry Schaefer the check. Lewis Berry was the founder and the president. He looks at the check, knew the man who wrote it, knew the cowboy rancher, and he says, gentlemen, God sold the cattle. God meets our needs in the most creative, unforeseen ways. And it's always on time. It's always enough. 
It's never what we expected, though. But we, we're, it's a good thing to be in a place of need, and it's an even better thing to be in a place where we recognize we have need, where we feel the need, and we start looking to God instead of the things that we used to rely on. That's where God takes Elijah now. So verse 4 to 6, let's see the interesting ways God meets needs. Because that's, that's the thing. God will meet your needs his way. He'll meet your needs, but his way. Probably not yours. You will drink, God tells Elijah, verse 4, from the brook. Okay, that's not too bad. And I've ordered the ravens to feed you there. Huh? So, Elijah did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, okay, outside of that promised land, and he stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. All right, put yourself in Elijah's shoes. Remember, the point is God will meet your needs his way, not yours. Elijah, uh, he's not expecting a brook, you know, a well was where you got your water, but a brook, okay, that'll do. That's not, that's not too big of a push. But the ravens thing, these are unclean birds. Elijah's a man of God. He wouldn't take, he wouldn't take meat and bread from an unclean bird, but that's exactly what God prescribes. Man, God challenges Elijah's religious expectations, and he challenges your and my religious expectations when we're in a place of need and we bring that need to God. He might do something that makes you squirm a little bit. It's not going to contradict what he said in Scripture, but it'll probably contradict some preconceived notions and expectations you and I had. He does it also outside of the promised land. Elijah's going beyond the borders. He's not in that special land anymore. He's outside of it, and that's exactly where God provides. Whoa. Again, he challenges the expectations the preconceived notions. God's making Elijah practice an object lesson. He's telling him, stick with me and I'll take care of you no matter how hopeless or impractical your situation. Stray from me though, like the people had, you're on your own. Let's see how that works out. See, we each need an experience with God to establish that, that felt trust in God. He comes through, and we can, we can make mental ascents to him, but there's times he comes through tangibly. He comes through in an experienced way, and he loves doing that for us, and he does it for Elijah here. So I ask you, have you asked God to meet your needs? Have you, have you even done that? Have you asked God to meet your needs? And not, not just kind of like, you know, God is the plan C, you know, God, I, I've got some things worked out. I'll probably be fine. Um, I know what I'm going to do here, and if that doesn't work, then I've got this plan. And then you find yourself kind of in a corner, and then you say, oh, God, yeah, uh, could you help meet my needs? I could probably take care of them, but he's kind of your cushion, your hedge. Have you asked God alone to meet your needs? Elijah's in that situation. He's got nothing. Nothing's growing. Nothing's flowing. And God takes him to a place where there should have been no provision, but there's abundant provision for him. Have you asked God to meet your needs? Do you really trust God to do that? It's, it's, this is difficult to think about, right? If you're honest, if I'm honest, when you ask God to provide for your needs, you're putting your own faith at risk. Because what if God doesn't provide? Right? That's the question you have. That's the second question you have to ask. It's easy to ask God to provide, but if you do, are you thinking with me, like, what if he doesn't provide? What does that mean then about the God that I say I believe in? The God I've heard about? The God I tell others about? There's a lot of what ifs when you ask God to provide. That's why it's easier to rely on ourselves, right? I'm not going to fail me, and if I fail me, well, I'm just human. You know, what could you expect? When you ask God, man, it's, it's putting faith on the line, right? Because there's a lot of what-ifs that might not happen. And that means, that means there might be something more to the needs that we bring to God. Often the needs that we feel are not the needs that are real. They're not what we really need. 
Even in this case, Elijah, he's hungry, he's thirsty, right? If you know Elijah's whole story, though, later on, he'll go 40 days without eating anything. And then, you know, and they'll run like a marathon and outrun a king. Like, this man is far more capable in God's power and in God's provision than he is alone. So, as much as it feels like Elijah has a, a need for food and water right now, we know that with God, there's a lot more that's possible. And Elijah would come to learn that, yeah, he could go without a meal today or tomorrow or this month. So, his real need was something a little behind the scenes, something a little deeper. His real need was the same need that Israel had, to bring their needs to God, not to themselves, not to their, their own resources. That's what God's doing. Often you and I ask, God, help me so that I won't have a need for you anymore, right? We don't like need. We don't like feeling need or having need. And so we ask God to provide our needs because we don't like being needy. But by not wanting to be needy, we're saying, God, I don't want to need you. And that's the trouble. Sometimes with our requests for needs to be met, with our efforts to meet our needs, it's a good thing to be needy. Can we embrace being needy? Why don't you just say it with me? I am needy. Yes, we are. That's a good thing. Everything everybody else will tell you is that's a bad thing. God is saying that's a good thing. That actually gets you right in the path of the stuff I'm doing, stuff I want to do in you and then through you. It's good to be needy. God invites us to ask him to meet our needs. I love what Jesus says in Matthew 11, right? Matthew 11:28. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. So the second question, I guess, out of this part so far is how has God met your needs? This is when it's so fun to talk about what he's done. I loved on Wednesday night, we were here for Thanksgiving Eve and we shared ways that God had come through for us. Either things that were just about God because of who God is, and he's so good. And then other stories about the ways that he's come through, met us in low spots or hard spots. Talk about the times that God has met your needs. This is especially important for parents, right? Kids that grow up in church hear the God stories and the God talk and the God jargon. And then eventually, um, when they graduate and, and have some freedom and responsibility to make their own decisions, they might stop coming. Well, why do they stop coming? There's a lot of factors, different studies have shown, but one of them is that the faith was never real. Like, it never invaded the life of the family that they lived in. So when you're at home, talk about ways that God has met your needs. Real faith experiences, ways that God came through, talk about those often. That's what God told Israel to do in Deuteronomy 6, and the same truth is for us today. Talk about often. How's God working? What's he doing? Keep that active. Because an active, experienced faith, man, it becomes a faith you hold on to, a God you hold on to, who holds on to you. So how has God met your needs? Have you asked him to meet your needs? This is the tricky part, though. God's ways of providing require our ongoing dependence on him. So look at where this leads Elijah, right? He's at the brook. He's drinking from the brook. These unclean birds, birds that should have been forbidden, are bringing happy meals every day to him, and he's doing okay. He'd just gotten over the fact that these are birds, you know, these are like pigeons, ravens, blackbirds. These aren't bald eagles swooping in with a new fish or something. No, you know, I'm picturing like pieces of meat, you know, and he's taking them, thanks. You know, maybe there's a little tug of war as he tries to pull it away from the bird. And the bread, maybe he's like trying to scatter the birds to get the bread. I wouldn't want to eat that way, but Elijah, I mean, it's keeping him alive, right? He'd gotten used to it. Just when he got used to it, verse 7, every time, sometime later, the brook dried up. Come on! Like, it was just working for me. God, you told me to go here. You, I broke all the rules that I had. Now I'm here, and come on, you're failing me. You just started meeting my needs. Now you're failing to meet my needs. You ever feel that way? He never lets us get comfortable. We're a needy people. That's never supposed to end. We're always supposed to feel our need, which is just a trigger, a launch pad to go to him constantly with utter dependence. 
That's what Elijah learns. The brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. It's interesting how God had kind of removed Elijah from um, the area that was especially under judgment for now with the whole famine and the drought. But eventually it had ramifications and it affected Elijah still. You know, God removed him from the place that was experiencing judgment, but then he too felt the judgment because he needed to feel what his people were feeling. Uh, verse 8, or verse 9. The word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. Okay. Verse 10. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? <laughs> He's finally like, No brook, no brook. As she was going to get it, he called, oh, And bring me a piece of bread too, please. That stopped her in her tracks. As surely as the Lord our God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks now to make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. What? Elijah said to her, I don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and, brought, and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. Is he being selfish? No. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. She went away, did as Elijah told her, and there was food every day for Elijah and the woman and her family. The jar of flour was not used up. The jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the Lord, the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah, man of the people. Where God meets your needs, he wants to meet others' needs as well. What God does for you, he also wants to do through you for someone else. Elijah was cool with having a, a daily meal and, and brook to drink from. But if he were honest, he'd be like, yeah, but all my countrymen don't have this provision. They're not getting their needs met the way I am. God gets them out of that comfortable place and moves them to a place where he's now with some people. Not, notice, not Israelites yet. Elijah's now with people who, who dwelled in the land where Baal worship originated. Again, God, come on, what are you doing? God takes Elijah a little further, further away from the things that were supposed to be working out, in the very center, the hometown of Baal worship, the hometown hero of this, this area is Baal, not God. But that's where God puts Elijah to teach him about meeting needs. Strange. Because what God does for you, he wants to do for others. God gets Elijah uncomfortable. It would have been polite. It would have been easier for Elijah when he met this widow to be like, oh, certainly she's not the one who's going to provide for me. You know, a widow. She had nothing. A widow was at the bottom of the social ranking in that day. There was no man of the household to, to provide, to show that God's favoring, to show that things are working the way they're supposed to be. The man had died. It's the woman and her son. And by the way, that son would represent to her everything. And we'll see what that means just in a little bit as the story unfolds. But for now, Elijah's here with someone he shouldn't have been with, right? She can't provide. And then she even verifies, yeah, I can't provide. I was actually ready to die. And then you walked in, and you want meals? You can't do it. What is God doing? Well, what he's doing is connecting Elijah's need to someone else's need, because that's what God does. God will meet your needs his way, and his way always brings you into the way of other people. It's just the way he operates. You got to catch the irony of all this, right? Nothing is working the way it's supposed to, and it's exactly the way God wants it to work. Our needs are never in isolation. So maybe you're, you're thinking, man, I, I just want a friend. God, I need a friend. Maybe God would make you the friend to someone else. Maybe he'll bring someone into your life who you don't want to be friends with. And then eventually, after they kind of wear you down, they become a close friend. I was just at... Um, a funeral for a man who became a close friend 
who I had nothing in common with. He shouldn't have been a friend. And he was kind of annoying sometimes. And then, man, God gave me a close, close friend. Maybe you've been asking God for healing. Maybe God wants you to pray for someone else's healing in the midst of your own need. Maybe you've been asking God for money. You just, there's not enough. I wonder if he would invite you to meet someone else's need with money. There's a great little story in Mark 12 about a lady who had nothing. And she put in all she had, which was just a couple pennies. And Jesus saw it and said, hey, that's, that's the kind of giving I love. She gave all she had. We're meant to be needy. Don't think that the point of life is to get past our needs and get them all met. We're supposed to be needy. That might mean that God wants to keep you in a place of need and have you help meet someone else's need. That's what he did for Elijah. That's what he did for the widow. Okay, let's wrap it up. So, the story continues. Sometime later, in verse 17, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him in in her arms, uh, from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Oh, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? And he stretched himself out on the boy three times. And cried out to the Lord, Oh Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. Put yourself in Elijah's shoes, right? You have this this amazing track record with God, this experience after experience of God coming through in strange, powerful ways. It's always been on time, it's always been enough. But it's been scary. It's made you question everything that you had pretty certain before. But now this kid... This, this, to this widow, this kid was everything. It's her son. He's, he's not only the real helper in the family, he's the symbolic provision and, and sign of favor for her family. Without him, she's nothing. Some of you might know some, some of the other stories in the Bible about Ruth. Uh, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, had some sons, and they both died. And so she wasn't going to have any family line. Her own husband had died, the son's and sons-in-law had died, she's got nothing left. There's no man in her household, and that meant she was completely condemned. And so Ruth's mom, Naomi, said to her, just let me die. Just go away, let me die. This woman was right there, right? Elijah met her when she was saying, just let me die. Now her son dies, and she's really like, what's going on? Why are you doing this with my heart? Just let me die, please. If you came here to kill me, then just kill me. So Elijah takes the boy upstairs And with all this on his mind, on his heart, knowing what God's done, but that was food and water. Now, it's life. It's breath. Is God going to come through? So he prays once. Nothing happens. God, come on. Don't do this. You know the need I have. You know this woman. This isn't even for me, God. This is for this woman. Please, God, come on. He prays again. Nothing. Man, that's why it's so risky to take your needs to God, because what if nothing? The third time, he stretches himself out, Lord God, please. And the boy starts to breathe. God provided. God showed up. In a household's that he seemingly didn't belong in, in a land he seemingly didn't belong in, through people who are so detached, through a prophet who had so many needs of his own. Wow, God showed up. We're meant to be needy. We're meant to bring our needs to God. And he loves coming through because where God sends you, he meets you. Where he meets you, he sends you to others. And in that place, he transforms you, right? Think about Elijah's journey so far. So far for for Elijah, God was a rain maker and a rain taker. He was a bird tamer. To Elijah, God was a brook filler. He was a travel guide. He was a bread maker and oil resupplier. But now 
He's the life giver. He's the dead raiser. He's the one who comes through when there is no possible way for a solution. All along, God's been testing Elijah to bring his needs to God. And Elijah did, and God keeps meeting them. Never in ways Elijah would expect, but always sufficiently, always just in time. That real need of, of drought, of rain, of food, just showed Israel's need for God, their need to be bringing their needs to God. And that's what Elijah then would carry back to his people. The point is that we're inadequate. You and I need something and someone way beyond ourselves. So first, our needs connect us to God, who meets them abundantly, and our needs connect us to others that God wants to provide for as well. The universal truth here is we have a God who provides for all our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And the need underneath all of our needs is one for life, life from death. That's what Jesus is. That's what he does. He always answers that prayer for need, uh, for life, for spiritual life. Love what Jesus said in John 7, 37. Anyone who's thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. As the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And John says, when he said living water, he was speaking about the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. Our God wants to meet your needs. Physical, even more, who you need in, in Jesus. He wants to meet your heart's need for relationship with God. He loves you. Feel your need and bring it to him. Would you pray with me? Lord, it goes against everything that, that, I, that I aspire, that I work for. Lord, I, we in this room, we work so hard to have more than enough, to be capable, to be smart, to be able to handle trouble and issues. The truth is, you handle our issues. You've given us deep responsibility for our life, but not, not so that we can live it without you. So Lord, we confess our need. I pray right now in this room for these people, awaken their heart to their desperate need, whatever that means. For some, it's gonna be physical or financial or relational. But I know, Lord, for all of us, we need to have a need for you more and more that never gets old. So, Lord, awaken our hearts to feel the kind of desperate need we have for you because I know you're just waiting to fill that need with your presence, with your spirit. Lord, pour out yourself in our place of need. In Jesus' name, amen.